Hey everyone, John Michael here. On today's episode of H2OMG, I take a trip to the studio of local papermaker and printmaker Laura Post. And if you're wondering what papermaking has to do with water, well, don't worry because we cover that pretty early in our talk. And as it turns out, water is extremely important to papermaking. Laura has also been experimenting with making paper from plants that are considered invasive here in our North Texas environment. And you know, we here at H2OMG are all about getting rid of non-native plants and replacing them with native ones. They'll look better and require less water than non-native plants because, duh, they're native to this environment. We talk a lot about Laura's amazing artwork in this episode, and if you want to take a look at what we're talking about as we're talking about it, check out her website at www.laurarpost.com. That's L-A-U-R-A-R-P-O-S-T.com. Or her Instagram, at laurarpost, and it's spelled the same as her website. I'll also put these links in the show notes so you can find them there. Now, let's get to the episode. Um, okay, can we start by saying, uh, what's your name? Laura Post. And what do you do? So, I'm an artist, and I primarily focus in papermaking and printmaking especially woodblock printing and paper making with invasive plants. So people listening might be wondering why we're talking about paper making on a podcast about water. And a lot of people might not know that water uh, is very important to paper making, right? So can you tell us a little bit about the paper making process in general? Sure. So water is a huge part of the paper making process and the water quality actually matters a lot for even the commercial papers that you might be getting um, to print from your printer at home. And so water is used for the in in my studio water is first used um, for once you collect the plants that you want to process. Um, depending on the plant, oftentimes I'll steam the bark with water, um, so that I can, so the bark releases from the branches. Then you clean, you kind of clean the bark and you take the part that you want and you discard the part that you don't. And then you cook it in water, um, using a mild solvent like soda ash or lye. And then, and that's kind of waste, you know, that's a waste water that needs to be disposed of properly. Um, and then what people might think of more is once you have the pulp, well, actually, no, then you beat the pulp, um, using, a, either like a blender, if you are trying to do like a, a home operation, or I have a Hollander beater and that takes water. And the, one of the big functions of the beating process, um, in, to create paper is it's breaking down the plant or the clothing or whatever it is that you're using it breaks it down into a finer material but you're also doing what's called fibrillating a fancy word which is essentially roughing up the edges of all of those little pieces of pulp um, so that they absorb water so that they hold water in them and that's really important for the next phase the kind of final phase the sheet forming step of paper making um, which is when you actually take a mold Um, like a a screen of some kind and you pull the pulp out of a vat of water. So you suspend the pulp in water. Once it's beaten, you suspend the pulp in a vat of water and then you use some kind of screen to pull the pulp out of the water and the hydrating process that you do in beating helps those little pieces of pulp stick together and they want to they want to bond with each other so that when they dry they make a nice sturdy sheet of paper. Yeah. Um so longtime listeners will know that I went to school for art because I usually I talk to a lot of science people. And so I don't want to sound like a total idiot, so I tell them I don't know anything about science. I went to school for ours. I say that in almost every episode. So if you've got your H2OMG bingo cards, go ahead and mark down that I mentioned that I went to school for art. But specifically, I got an MFA in book arts. And so we did a lot of paper making. So I was very excited to find Laura. Um, And the way that I found her is that the Fort Worth Public Library posted about a workshop that you were doing, a paper making workshop, Mm -hmm. right? At one of their libraries. And so I missed the workshop. I saw it after saw the post after it happened, but, um, yeah, I was very excited to find you and I wrote to you and yeah, so now I'm here in your, in your home studio 
and I'm looking at your Hollander beater. I forgot. I knew that they were called beaters. I forgot about the word Hollander. Um, so that's cool to see one of those again. And I'm looking at your press and, and all your really cool stuff. And you, you mentioned a minute ago that, um, the fibers that you're using, uh, can be from, uh, old clothes or plants. And so a lot of our listeners might not know that you can make paper out of, uh, a whole assortment of things like almost anything really. Like, um, I've done paper out of old clothes, um, make paper out of old paper and you do, um, something that was very interesting to me and to our conservation team, you make paper out of, um, invasive plant species. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. And I think it is, it's important to say that, yeah, you can make paper out of a lot of things. And the easiest thing to do at home is to make paper from recycled paper, which is something I often forget. Um, because I just skip that and go to all these other crazy things. <laughs> but, um, and I also just want to say, kind of as a side note, you know, what, what I'm doing is handmade paper in a home studio, small scale operation. Um, but it actually is not that different than it has a lot of similarities to industrial, large scale commercial applications of paper making. Um, the materials they're using is more like a sawdust instead of instead of um, plants and they use a lot more solvents and there's all these other things that they put in the paper. But um, fundamentally and the use of water in industrial paper making is also extremely important. Um, so invasive plants um, are plants that aren't from a particular area, which you could say are non-native, but non for me, non-native plants is a wider category. There are a lot of plants that you'll encounter in people's gardens and that, you know, out um, that aren't from the area that you're currently in or that those plants are currently in. But an invasive plant takes that to the next st st step, next stage, and... Um, it's it has no natural predators so often it's it's brought to wherever it is for garden for like um landscaping purposes or sometimes for irrigation purposes or sometimes for growing f to make clothes or there's all kinds of reasons that people bring them but it's usually for landscaping because they think it's pretty and then it has no natural enemies in the area that it's in and it just kind of um takes over and depending on the plant, um, they, they, they all have different, every invasive plant has different properties. Um, and I, I should say issues that it causes, um, some are worse than others, but the, the biggest thing is, is that it starts to spread and then it prevents the native plants from growing and creates what's called a monoculture of just that mm. plant wanting to exist. Yeah. One of the things, one of the invasive species that I'm reminded of is, is from my home in Tennessee. Uh, kudzu was a really big thing. I don't know if that's such a problem here. It's funny because I thought that kudzu was an issue here, but it, as I was walking around, I would see these vines, um, in just in parks and stuff that seem like they're taking over, but I mm. actually think that they might be, they might be something else. Oh, okay. Um, and so, I've been collaborating a lot with the Fort Worth Botanic Garden and they oh, cool. said that, um, in fact, the invasive plants that I got for my workshops and that I've been, I collected all came from the Fort Worth Botanic Garden. Um, mm -hmm. but, and some from my yard actually. Um, but he, th someone there told me that kudzu isn't as much of an issue here. Um, I haven't made paper from kudzu and, most of the plants that I'm using are, it's called a bast fiber. So it's the, it's more like a tree, mm. a young yeah. tree. You know, you want the, you want to get branches that are about, you know, no more than two and a half to three inches in diameter and no smaller than like a quarter to a half inch, just because otherwise the properties um, don't work out as well. Yeah. But the kudzu, I think would actually be really good for like basket weaving oh, okay. because it's like the vines. I, people do make paper out of kudzu. I just haven't, huh. and it seems like it might be, it might be a lot of work. I mean, it's always a lot of work. Yeah, <laughs> I I know another use for kudzu. Like we, my parents would always talk about that people would like cut it up and eat it in salads. I don't know if that's a redneck thing. No, I but... heard I read this when I was trying to look it up. It's related to a pea. 
It's related to peas. Oh, it's in the pea family. Oh. Um, okay. According to some website that I read, and apparently you can eat it, and apparently it is delicious. Huh. Okay. So. Well, <laughs> if anyone's listening in Tennessee, go out in your backyard and grab some and, and try it um, because it's all over the place. Yes. In, in Tennessee. And I think maybe it's got to do with like the rainfall or something. But so, um, and we talked a little bit about how important water is in the paper making process. So are there any in the general paper making process, but are there any paper making processes that you know of that don't use water at all? It wouldn't. Well, actually that's a really interesting question. I don't think there are any that don't use water at all, but, um, the, there are, there are ways of doing it that are less water intensive. Um, one way so I, I mentioned that the um, the way that I usually make paper is by filling a, a vat, a tub with water um, and putting the pulp in it, which I've beaten through um, with water and everything. Um, and so for that, each, every type of pulp that you're going to use needs its own tub of water. Um, but there are traditions in, I think, Think, well, I know Nepal does it this way. I think Thai Thailand's paper is done this way as well, where they either use what's called a decal box. So this is getting very technical, and without visuals, without visuals, it might be hard to hard to imagine. But um, the kind of paper that I'm usually making is I'm holding that mold, mold and decal, that screen in my hands, and I'm scooping it into the water and lifting it up, and there's a sheet of paper. Yeah, and uh, just so everybody knows. Laura said I could take a video of her doing this and we'll post it so every, so everybody can see the process that we're talking about. So yeah, so sorry. Yeah. Um and so but then there's another way to do it. Well, a few other ways to do it. Um one would be called a decal box. So in that sense instead of um again, there's a lot of variations in how people do this, but um the you basically pour the water pulp mixture, pour it into the screen. Mm, okay. Um, and sometimes it's submerged in water while you do that and you lift it up. But in that case, it just means that the, there isn't the, the pulp isn't mixed directly into the vat. And so I think that that would actually use less water because it's like each sheet you're kind of picking out of the same thing and, and putting in the same thing. Yeah. Um, the other thing is there's another category of paper called which is often called like bark cloth um that would be like a mate paper in the mexican tradition or um also in i believe indonesia um i know someone that did a grant project there that, that where they'll do this with mulberry so instead of instead of doing all the steps that i said of like getting a plant, somehow cooking it, all of these different, uh, steaming it, then be all this stuff. They, um, they take the fiber in a more um, direct state, though there is some processing to get it to where it is. And then you beat it, beat, just like take the sheets of pole of the plant and beat them until like pound them out until they're kind of flat and like paper, paper like, um, Anyway, I think that that's also less water intensive. Yeah. But a lot more beating intensive. A lot more beating intensive or, or just a different, it's just different. It's yeah. a different, um, from start to finish, every step is a little bit different. Um, and so every country has developed its own paper tradition based on the plants and resources they have available to them. And certain things make sense in one context more and in other contexts a different, it, it's different. Is there, uh, so for people listening at home, um, is there an easy way for them to make paper without having any kind of like super special equipment? Yes. Um, I think, well, I want to give a shout out to the website paperslurry.com, P-A-P-E-R-S-L-U-R-R-Y dot com um because they have um it's run by a fabulous paper maker and she has a list that's that is literally like how to just how to get started making paper mm. at home oh, cool. um but i do think the easiest way is to take recycled is to take existing paper 
um, cut it up um, into, you know, small-ish pieces, like one-inch pieces, because it'll just help everything go faster. Um, soak it in water. Again, water will be important in this process. And then, um, ideally, if you have a blender, and I always give the PSA that I really need you to get a separate blender from your eating blender. Yeah. It needs to be... Um, I really discourage, I really discourage mixing your art tools and your eating tools, even though it's very tempting. You're never going to get all that pulp You're out of that blender. You're never going to so, get it all out. Yeah. If you don't mind eating a little bit of pulp, then go ahead. But <laughs> but make sure, you know, whatever crayons were on there, whatever, anything. Anyway, um, so anyway, then blend it up in the blender. Um, and then the next phase, again, it's a little bit hard to describe. Um, and that's why I really yeah. recommend there are many Internet resources, but paper yeah. slurry is a good one. But you need some kind of a screen that I use oftentimes, um, like window screening. Yeah. Particularly, it's called vinyl coated mesh, you know, so it's not necessarily like the aluminum um, screening, right. but like ones that are coated in a little bit of a plastic. Yeah. And, um, but there are, you, you can be creative, you know, you can use a very open cloth you could probably even use like a cheesecloth hmm. or something like there's a lot of alternative um yeah. things that you can use and again ideally if you can stretch that thing over some kind of a frame so that it stays um more rigid mm -hmm. that will help but also again i'm sure you can do it without <laughs> it just depends how committed you are to it of course yeah. there are also things that you can buy like pre-packaged you know kits and things yeah um and so yes you can definitely make paper at home so like i said i've done a little bit of paper making they had a um we had our own mill we had a hollander beater and for anyone listening who doesn't know what a hollander beater is and i i bet it's probably a hundred percent of the listeners um, cause it's such a specialized thing. It's basically like a lazy river, but for pulp. And so it sort of goes around in a circle and this big, um, almost like a, like a, the thing on the back of a river boat, like just kind of crushes it, crushes yeah. the paper and beats it for you. And, and it's all suspended in water and it's going around and it gets beat. Anyway, we had one of those, we had some big vats and we made some really big pieces of paper and I found the process very relaxing um, I'd listen to a podcast or listen to music or something and just make a bunch of paper and, um, it's a lot of fun. And if anyone's out there looking for a new hobby, um, it's a fun thing to get into. And I do, I do find it really relaxing with, to make paper with invasive plants. It, it's, it's so much labor up front to get to the point where before you're making until you can actually make the sheets of paper. Mm -hmm. And every time I'm like, Oh, why am I doing this? It's like there's this step and that step and that step and that step and it just goes on and on and on. <laughs> and then I get to the point where I'm pulling sheets of paper and I'm like, oh yeah, this is awesome. Yeah. And then you get some really nice paper out of the deal too. Um, yeah, I've been doing a lot of uh, like jamming and preserving and I'll do like big batches of strawberry jam and there's a lot of cutting and preparing and every time i do it i'm like i'm never i'm never ever doing this again because then i just give it away for free and it's like nobody gives me the jars back <laughs> and uh psa so, give john michael his <laughs> strawberry jars back please i tell them if you give me the jar back i'll refill it for free <laughs> i'm not trying to make money off this i just want my jars back everybody but yeah every time i'm doing it i think i'm never doing this again this this sucks um but I, then i end up doing it again but yeah so it's a little bit similar um I don't think I've made any paper since I've, since I graduated just cause like you said, there's a, there's a lot of equipment. Um, and me personally, I was never good enough at getting a consistent sheet to print on it. Cause we did a lot of letterpress printing and you got to have really consistent sheets to be able to get like a nice letterpress print on that. And I was never good enough at making the sheets consistently. So I bought all my paper. A lot of people in my, in my group, um, were a lot better at making paper. So they would, um, make paper out of all kinds of cool stuff and they would get a nice sheet that would print really well. But I was never 
I was never that good at it. Um, I just like to do it because it was fun and messy. And um, well, yeah. the thing that's so interesting, and it's interesting because in in this studio, in my studio, I um, I'm getting better at making consistent sheets, but the, I'm also coming at it from more of an art, the art side. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, so some people are like production paper makers and they make amazing, beautiful, consistent sheets of paper by hand. Um, and I can, and I'm going to do it, um, cause I want to have, <laughs> I want to have, I've had a lot of requests for like, where can I, can I buy this invasive plant paper? Um, and I'm working on it, but the thing that's so cool to me about the invasive plant paper or just paper in general is that every plant has a different color once you process it and a different texture and so what I've been doing is really um I've been layering the different types of pulp you can think of them like paint pigments um each one is a different color each one is a different texture and when you layer them together you can make an image with them um and you can also mix the colors together um, so I might mix like um, jeans, you know, like a dark blue denim that I've um, recycled and processed into pulp. And then if you mix that with like um, here, there's um, Ch Chinese parasol is one of the ones I was using. It's kind of a yellowish. It's like a beautiful, actually like a beautiful daisy kind of yellow color when it dries. And if you mix that together, it actually would turn green. You know, it, it operates like paint. Mm. And so... Um, I've been making what are called pulp paintings where you're taking all these different kinds of pulp and you mix them to, and you mix them together and you layer them together and then um, they make they make an image and I, I make portraits so I yeah. make portraits out of them. Can you and I, I've been to your website. Can you tell people your website so people can sure. check it out? Sure. Um, the easiest way is laurarpost.com. So that's L A U R A R P O S T dot com cool and so you just mentioned pulp painting and before that we were basically talking about how to make flat sheets of paper but i'm looking around your studio and you've got a lot of uh, sculptures can you talk a little bit about like what what that process is like and how that's different from making a flat sheet of paper sure so um yeah i have these i have sort of like a few things going on at once always um so making pulp paintings as like a flat thing, that's um, one body of work. And the other thing I do is exactly that. I make pa paper sculptures. So I'm combining um, my woodblock prints, my handmade sheets of paper, life casts, and then actually also um, CNC routed molds. So, so anyway, there's, there's all these different things. And for me, it all stems from printmaking. And because for me, printmaking is like the ability to make multiples. And so I, at a certain point, I realized that any, um, anything that allowed me to make a copy of something, that was a print. And that includes, um, again, a life cast. It's actually, I took, we'll call it, a, I took a mold from someone's face, usually always my family. Um, and then I can use that mold and, um, cast it with handmade paper and not handmade paper uh, or not hand paper that I didn't make but I can use any material and I can cast in it and then I can start to layer all of those things together um, again it's a little bit hard to describe um, but it's it really is it's using um, my woodblock prints it's using engravings handmade paper and and using all of those materials to um, combine together and wheat paste I have to give a shout out to wheat paste because um, it's such an important other material that I use in my art practice so if anyone had shout out to wheat paste on their h2omg bingo cards you mark that now <laughs> um, yeah that this her sculptures are another reason to check out her website because they're really incredible and um, I was wondering how I guess I don't know a lot about sculpture, but I assume that you had like um, a sort of uh, so, so you take a, a life cast of your family member, like you said, and that's a whole process that I, I don't know anything about. And then you you just sort of press the pulp onto that in, in the shape of it. So there's a few different ways to do um, casting with paper pulp and, and 
a lot of art there are a lot of artists doing it in in different ways what i found works best for me is to actually still pull a sheet of paper just like what i was describing mm, as oh. if i was making as if i was just gonna make a sheet of paper um and then um you blot some water off of it so it's not completely so it's it's not dry but it's um it, the fiber is holding together better it, it wants to stick to itself um and then you can um with some of the water removed you can start to just pick up those wet sheets of paper and press them and press them in so it starts as a thin shell um with you know just thinnish or you know thinnish sheets of paper and then depending what i want to do i can layer more behind it or sometimes i'll even put again like a a paper that I've printed a uh, woodblock or some other thing or drawing or something on, I'll put that in the mold and then I can actually layer my own sheets of paper on top of that. Um, thanks to wheat paste. Um, <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I don't know. Did I answer the question? I think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned to me that you were interested in conserving water since you use a lot of water in the studio you want to be able to conserve it and you mentioned to me that you'd be interested in that and we work very closely with the conservation group so we're always talking about on the podcast and on social media about how to conserve water and so do you do you have any ways that you are conser are conserving water right now i think the biggest thing is just trying to reuse reuse the water when I can. And so, um, for example, when you run a batch of pulp through the Hollander beater, um, sometimes I'm not using it right away. And so I'll strain, I'll just strain the pulp out of that water. Um, and then I'll try to reuse that water. Let's say if I'm beating another batch of pulp, um, I want to get rain barrels, um, rain collection barrels, because I think that that would be. I did. I did a version of this paper making project. The first version with um, invasive plants was with a collaborator of mine in Utah, and water was very scarce. I mean, it was a desert, um, though there was a river. But but anyway, we um, the property that we were staying on had rain collection barrels. It had two or three of them, and we used you know, we used all of it, basically, um, they were full, and we used all of it through the process. And so I think that would be a really exciting thing. But right now, it's mostly just kind of re, you know, if I'm not using water for something, reusing it, and then if I can't use any more, then I use it to water my plants. Yeah. Can I give a shout out to steam? Since my like parents, steam the like, hot <laughs> water? No, like science, technology, engineering, oh, yeah. art. <laughs> and math <laughs> i thought you meant really hot water in a gaseous state i was like yeah you can give a that, shout out to that, that sure. um you know i give a shout out to wheat paste so i feel like that was fair, <laughs> a fair thought <laughs> yeah um well how was that your whole shout out sorry <laughs> no i mean I'm, i just was gonna and then i was gonna say because i said like my parents work with water yeah 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 related stuff and so it's always been part of my thought process. Yeah. Even though it's, even though I didn't, con paper, that's not why I went into paper making. But. <laughs> yeah. What can you just real quick? Can you tell what, what you told me already in the email, but what do your parents do that's related to water? Yeah. So my parents feature in my artwork, both as subjects and, um, kind of in the background as as inspirations i mean obviously because they're my parents but they are both um they're both coming from a science background um my dad is a chemical engineer focusing on um uh treating water in industrial cooling applications mm -hmm. so like any actually he, he's worked a lot in paper mills um and all of those industrial applications that require water um, and then that water needs to go back out into the ecosystem, um, the water needs to be treated um, so it can safely go back out into mm -hmm. the into the world. Um, and then on the other side, my my mom um, is a toxicologist who works on 
um, toxicity standards for chemicals in drinking water. She works for the state of New Jersey. Okay. Um, and so that's always been, I don't know, the water has always been a topic of conversation in our, in our house. Um, and so I always just like to emphasize the, the STEAM, you know, the science, technology, engineering, art, and math, the A to me is really important um, in that in that phrase um, because they are all connected, and we, you know, as a society and maybe as the world right now, kind of separate all of these things, but they really all interrelate. And you know, the amount of chemistry that goes into making um, your watercolors that you might even like a little kid crayola a watercolor yeah. set, the amount of chemistry that goes into that kind of stuff is really necessary. Well, you mentioned toxicity standards in drinking water, and so that means that I have to give a shout out to our annual water quality report, which was just released uh, last month, and it's available on our website. I think if you go to, pretty sure it's fortworthtexas.gov slash tap water, you can see the English version, and we've also got the Spanish version. So it tells you all about what's in the drinking water, all the tests that we've run, um, and there's some articles in there about what we're doing Um to improve all these processes. And so, yeah, um, I design it. So I'm very proud of it. I also, I wanted to ask if any of these sculptures around here are your parents. Um, I'm sitting yeah, right next yeah, to one. Is this one, one? Yeah, <laughs> that's my, both my parents. So those are both oh, cool. CNC routed. I, I the, the mold is here, but the foam that's just helping to hold it up, that's like a CNC routed. So I did a 3D scan of them. Mm. In that case, the file is the print to me because that's the thing that can be the multiple. Um, and then, because I, I've been working with LifeCast, you can see, I don't know, all this will probably get cut out, but um, but then you're subject to the size of people's faces. Like you're stuck with the life size, um, which is great, but I wanted the chance to scale up, scale down. His faces are pretty small when you think about it. They are. Yeah, they are. Like if you're especially if you're thinking about, you know, like a monumental scale artwork or, you know, like a, even just like a large painting. Yeah, it's a lot of faces to get to the size of that. Um, and so I've been playing around with um, but I am also I, I still I wouldn't really call myself a sculptor. You know, I'm coming at it from this other hmm. way. Yeah. And so it's a steep learning curve just all just everything yeah um and i think it's it's i think it's a good challenge i think like i'm i'm excited i do it because it's like a, a challenge for my brain to wrap my head around it yeah um but yeah yeah anything else you want to shout out you mentioned your what <laughs> you want to mention your website again do you have um social media like how can people find yeah, out about yeah, the classes so, that you yeah so that's a great that's a great point because i actually i will also be having another paper making class and um a non paper making class at the Fort Worth Botanic Garden oh, in the cool, fall. Cool, cool. Um, and I think the registration is up for both of those classes. Um, but so the best way to find me is again, my website, lararpost.com, but that's also my Instagram handle where I post a lot of things about it's, I, I post my upcoming workshops and, and events and that kind of stuff. And I also just have like behind the scenes of what I'm working on in the studio. Um, you can see how messy the studio actually is um, while we're, when you're, when I'm in it. Paper making is messy people. <laughs> and I'm messy. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your favorite movie about water? Oh man, that is such a hard question. Um, That's not, an, not wow. an easy question. I mean, Free Willy is the thing that's <laughs> popping into my head that's first. Good. That's good. I don't think anybody said that yet. That's good. Yeah. But it really made me, I mean, it really made me sad when I was a kid. Like, I, that movie really got to me. Yeah. It is. It's, it's very sad. I haven't seen it in a long time, but I remember I watched it and all the sequels. And, uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Laura, for having me in your studio and um, for talking about papermaking and water. Yeah, thanks for coming, and um, I hope everybody gets in touch with me soon. Thanks very much for listening, and a huge thanks to Laura for inviting me to her studio and for taking the time to talk papermaking with me. Remember to check out her website, laurarpost.com. 
Laura also has a solo exhibition opening at the Fort Worth Community Art Gallery on September 10th, my birthday, and running through October 30th, 2021. So stop by and check that out. And if you've listened to this episode and decide you want to try your hand at making paper, well, now is the perfect chance because Laura has a papermaking workshop at BRIT, the Botanical Research Institute of Texas, right here in Fort Worth, on September 18th, 2021. You can find more info about that at shop.brit.org slash papermaking. I'll put all these links in the show notes, so look for them there. Thanks again to Laura, and thanks to everyone for listening. See you next time.